Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. That's how the cannabis industry should be, right? 80% of applicants were rejected. And those should be owned by people who can walk out of their house and go open up their business. But unfortunately, their owners are hours away or honestly probably states away. You know, as long as you have your patient card, if you're stopped by the police, that's one less trip that you have to worry about going to jail. Yeah. It's like an insurance card. They want help, they want to sleep, they want to reduce anxiety, extreme relief, they're being able to ditch opioids. To basically um, grandfather themselves in and then open up a lottery process for everyone else, you still, once again, do not do the communities that were wronged a, a service. People in our community that look like us that say, I didn't know that I could qualify for a court. Mm -hmm. You absolutely can. Looking back, do you feel like Missouri's system is predatorial? I'm Sarah Fenske. In January, Missouri's first Black-owned dispensary opened its doors in the city's Forest Park Southeast neighborhood, often called The Grove. The shop is called Luxury Leaf. And joining us today to talk about this dispensary is its owner, Adrian Scales Williams. Adrian, welcome. Thank you. And we're also joined today by Jamila Owens Todd. She is a naturopathic doctor, a cannabis consultant, and the general manager of Luxury Leaf. She also teaches cannabis pharmacology at St. Louis University. Jamila, welcome. I'm happy to be here. So, Adrian, let's start with you because this story really starts with you. You've said you didn't set out to own a dispensary. What first got you interested in medical marijuana? Well, what first got me interested was something that was very, very very near and dear to my heart, which was my mother. In 2016, my mother was diag diagnosed with pancreas cancer. Ooh. And um, I watched her suffer, and I had no, um, I didn't have ability to purchase medicinal marijuana in the state of Missouri. I reached outside, tried to find some um, outside of the state, and of course you can't um, sell things across state lines. So I was unable to ease the pain of my mom. And that was 2016. So that um, led me to think, wow, I got to make sure that if something like this happens in Missouri, that I'm able to have the products and to sell it to someone who's interested. And then in 2017, someone else very, very dear to my heart, which was my dog, Rocco, he got diagnosed with cancer. And so I tried to find the natural way to uh, dose him, and there was nothing in St. Louis that I could do to help him. So those two very, very important people near and dear to my heart led me to the medicinal um, um, products. So many people, I feel like, have stories where they start looking into this, and from there they end up becoming activists or, you know, they mm -hmm. decide that they want to vote in favor of this. It ended up being on the state ballot. But you took it even a step further. You decided you wanted to go into business to do this yourself. When you had that thought, was it hard to then figure out, okay, where do I go from here? How do I make this dream happen? It was hard. But the state of Missouri, um, when they put out the, um, the application for you to consider, it actually kind of led you through the way of how you could achieve it. So um, I'm also um, pre-approved in the state of uh, Michigan. So I've been interested in it since about 2018. Okay. Yes. And, and what line of work had you been in before you got started down this path? Well, I'm currently still in business as a printer for architect, engineer, and construction firms in the, in the state of Missouri. Also, I do strategic sourcing for casinos with um, 80 casinos outside of St. Louis. So I've always been in the marketing aspect of um, selling to clients. Okay. Yeah. So it seems like that would be really good groundwork for getting into something like this where there's so many regulatory pieces of it. There's a lot of sourcing issues, all sorts of things you have to worry about. Yet, so after the state legalized medical cannabis, this was in 2018, more than 80% of applicants were rejected. What do you think was the key for you to making it through that process? Um, blessed. 
Blessed yeah. by God. I mean, you know, I um, had prayed a lot about what I wanted to do in regards to medical uh, marijuana. I was also blessed to find Dr. Jamila because my whole thought process is that I wanted to have the natural approach to uh, producing, or I'm not producing, but to um, explain to the community about the medicinal benefits of marijuana. Mm-hmm. And so that's what led me into it is the the whole natural way of taking care of some of the pain. And so Jamila, that brings us to you. I understand you started consulting for Adrian in 2021. That's correct. What were you helping her with at that point? Um, so the SOPs, operational components of um, a dispensary, a lot of it was education, just kind of bringing her up to speed on what the proprietor should know in this industry um, and training staff and building out training programs. And so what was your background that this was something that you ended up getting into? Um, it's a long and sorted twisted tale. I'll tell you. <laughs> Hopefully not too sorted, but <laughs> let me give you the cliff notes version on this. Okay. Um, started as a chemist and just went into natural medicine as a naturopathic physician. Uh, my training in Toronto, where I was first introduced to patients using cannabis for chemo- chemotherapy support and cancer support. I came to St. Louis and I'm from St. Louis. I came back to St. Louis in 20, oh, 2007, okay. started to practice. And then I 2015 is where I really started to introduce cannabis or CBD, I should say at that time, which was legal for patients with uh, Dravet syndrome or epilepsy or seizure disorders. And from there, I started meeting people in the industry who were growing hemp in Missouri and just kind of got in through that way and then started to work. um, When it became legal, I worked for a company that has a license as the manufacturer in the manufacturing department as a research mm-hmm. uh, manager and so that was for a year and then left that and became a consultant and that's how I met uh, Adrian. So you've been through several parts of this journey and I feel like for CBD we now hear CBD is yeah. everywhere. People are giving us cocktails with CBD yeah. in them and it's become this this trendy <laughs> term but this is kind of directly related to the hemp plant. Absolutely. I mean, it, they're all the same. It's yeah. cannabis is cannabis sativa is the plant. There are some plants that are grown specifically for hemp or for the trade of hemp or CBD production, which is a low THC. And then there are plants that are grown for its higher THC content. So it's all cannabis sativa. It's just how it's how it's cultivated is where we're kind of delineating and now we're in this legal medical market. Okay. And so Jamila is coming in with sort of all this this knowledge of the chemistry and the science of these plants. And then you came in with the, the business knowledge that you have. This is kind of how the super group was formed. <laughs> correct. That is correct. Um, I actually work a lot um, with construction companies. And so the biggest part was staying in compliant with the state of Missouri, you look at the security that you have to have and all the compliance and making sure that uh, it's a safe place for uh, patients to come and purchase their products. So, yes, uh, we combined uh, the brains of the cannabis with uh, Jamila and then the brains of me with the business side of it. And she also has run a business, too. So mm-hmm. um, we just put those talents together and phenomenal we have Luxury Leaf. Yeah. So what made you want to locate Luxury Leaf in the Grove, also known as Forest Park Southeast? I know the old timers get mad if I say the Grove. I have to say both. It's the Grove. <laughs> it's the Grove. So I actually owned the building prior to um, getting the application or the license. Um, I've always been in the Grove area, um, mainly on Vandevanter. I was first at the top part of Vandevanter, um, right there at Kings Highway. And then I moved and bought the building that we are currently existing out of it um, in 2007. So I've always owned the real estate there. So you've seen that neighborhood go through some huge changes. Yes. I mean, I feel like it used to be, um, I don't know, it wasn't so much of a party destination, became a party destination. And then at the same time, this is also a place where where people are used to seeking things out. There's some shops there, things like that, that make it a good place to be. It is a really good place to be. Uh, Forest Park Southeast has done a lot. We have a neighborhood association that looks out for both the businesses and the residents in the area. And then um, there's going to be a really um, huge undertaking in regards to a grant that's been provided to do a bike route that's going to connect 
um, Forest Park Southeast with the Cortex area. So uh, we we're really excited about what they have excite what they have planned for the Forest Park Southeast area. So this is a whole bunch of good things coming together at once. Yes. We have uh, oh, two yeah. talented people. We have a good location. Jamila, you had mentioned that you worked for um, a licensed company here in Missouri. I understand you were the reset research and development manager. This is with Phytos Cannabis, which was a subsidiary of Bee Leaf Medical. A lot of people might know that name because they yes. kind of got in early and yeah. doing big things in the industry. What did you learn from that job? Oh, um, you know, I, I have to say, you know, Mitch Myers is a, I, I value her. She's definitely a a, a maven and a force in this industry. So she's um, a, a former um, Anheuser-Busch executive mm-hmm. who has since sort of really taken the plunge, gone all in on, right. on medical cannabis. Yeah. And so in its infancy, any industry or any business in its infancy is going through a lot of kind of learning, learning pains. And so we definitely went through all of that. Um, but, you know, excited to know that you come out on the other end with just understanding of operations um, if you didn't know compliance then, you thought you knew compliance, you're an expert in compliance after that. So it, it, was, um, it was a great opportunity, and I'm very appreciative for it. And so when you guys got this, this team together, you ended up opening your doors in January of this year. Was that sort of the original target date, or is that something you had to adjust as, as the realities of everything you were dealing with kicked in? It actually was reality. We had uh, received approval to operate um, in November. But in order to become operational, there was a lot of things that we had to do in the back office to make sure that we uh, was ready to greet the public and bring them in. So Mm -hmm. it takes about six to eight weeks after you get approval to actually start operating. Uh, And so, yes, that's why it took us so long. But I would have loved to have started in 2021. But things happen the way they're supposed to. Yeah. And you were also doing this in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, everything got complicated. Supply chains, face-to-face meetings, everything was hard. Yes, everything was hard. And I think the one of the major obstacles we had when it came to security equipment, um, there were so many different components that we couldn't find or couldn't ha- um, didn't have access to. And so that actually pushed off our approval to operate because we had to wait for certain components to come in. We're talking today to Adrienne Scales-Williams. She's the proprietor of Luxury Leaf Dispensary. That's in the Forest Park Southeast neighborhood, also known as The Grove. We're also joined today by Jamila Owens-Todd. She's a naturopathic doctor, a cannabis consultant, and she is the general manager of Luxury Leaf. So you opened your doors in January. Um, Big exhale. (laughs) Here we go. Um, And Jamila, you really got into this because you wanted to help people as a doctor. Are you finding that the people who come to Luxury Leaf, they're dealing with medical issues, and these are medical issues where cannabis can help? Absolutely. I think if nothing else, people have learned um, to erase the stigma that's been associated with cannabis and cannabis consumption over the years. I often say when I teach classes, I have nothing against people wanting to get high. I think we need to, you know, detach from what that, the negative connotation of that. But uh, medicating is medicating. We often choose our vices uh, to be what's socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. Sugar is very available. It's addictive, and it's a vice that people use to medicate. So I am an advocate for plant medicine, have been and always will be, and cannabis is one of those plants that is uh, full of just opportunity when it comes to different developments in health and neurological support, anti-inflammatory pain. We see a lot of it for pain management. Mm -hmm. I really work with patients who have autoimmune conditions and pain associated with that. There's that pain response and the inflammatory response. So it is, I, I, I see it as world renowned medicine, um, as I do many plants. So I'm, I'm excited to be able to so- support people. But what we see, we see patients, they want help, they want to sleep, they want to reduce anxiety. I mean, it's, it's a real, real thing. And it's not, um, you know, this, this pseudo kind of medicine, it's, it's, it's helping, they're mm-hmm. finding extreme relief, they're being able to ditch opioids. We see report after report of patients who no longer have to take their hydrocodone or oxycodone and have found um, not just the pain reduction, but healing because of the additional components of the plant. 
And do you find then that you're seeing the same people now, we're in April, as when you first started? They're coming back. They're saying, here's how this has worked. Yeah, that's uh, one thing we've talked about is the testimonial wall, like getting that somewhere because they will come in and tell you. They bring in their grandparents. They bring in mom, sister, husband, wife, you know, and people are excited. And I think just because of the availability of it and feeling free to experience this medicine, now you, you open a new community of healing. And now people are exploring maybe my diet or other ways to get plants in. So I see it as a bigger movement. Um, so it's cool. Adrian, have there been any surprises now that you have some months behind you? Um, I would, um, the surprise I would say is that people don't know that they have access to get the patient card. I think that a lot of people believe that they have to have all these chronic illness in order to get the, uh, the patient card. But um, and so what Dr. Jamila and I have done is to try to help educate people in our community that look like us to say, I didn't know that I could qualify for a card. Mm-hmm. You absolutely can. And so uh, we have done as many sign up as possibly. Um, I, I will go and talk to people. I've been to people's house to help them get signed up for their patient card wow. uh, just because I believe in it. And um you guys were just talking about testimonies. I have at least 11 ladies that are 65 plus that are calling me saying it absolutely worked. I'm out of pain. My knees don't feel like they used to. My shoulder does not feel like it, do- it used to. Now, these ladies are interested in more of the tincture, which is what you put underneath the tongue. Mm-hmm. They're not interested in inhaling it, but they are what they really are interested in is, is being out of pain. Mm-hmm. And so every night I go to sleep knowing that I've helped some people get out of pain. And that is so rewarding. That's got to be a great feeling. It is. And you're going you're going and doing that one-on-one conversation with people or in small groups where you're saying, hey, this is open to you as well. That's something that, that people are surprised to hear. Yes, they are. And why do you think that is? That like she, tra- she chases people down. Yes. And she's get, you're going to get a car. Like she's very passionate about this. She, don't let her yeah. make that an understatement. I go to people's house. Um, I think that the other thing about the patient card is that for the younger generation that that consume marijuana mm-hmm. and they don't have a patient card and if they're stopped by the police, I always am flashing this saying, you can have four ounces of medical marijuana. Yeah. You know, as long as you have your patient card, if you're stopped by the police, that's one less trip that you have to worry about going to jail. Yeah. It's like an insurance card yeah. to me. So I'm very passionate about people getting their patient card beyond belief. Yeah. And if people want to do that, is that something that you can help them with right there at the dispensary? Or how does that process work? Do you refer them to somebody? So I can help them at the dispensary, uh, but we also have it on our website. Mm -hmm. So if someone wants to go to www.luxuryleafstl.com, there's a sign up uh, there. But for some of the people that are 65 plus, they don't, they're not really tech savvy. And so I'm more than happy to walk them through if they come to the dispensary, I would do it for them. Okay. So you mentioned this is something that uh, um, maybe within your own community, this is something that people don't necessarily realize that they can get in on and the benefits that come from that. Do you feel some pressure as the first black dispensary owner here in Missouri that you're here to try to talk to everybody, everybody who you think could benefit from this? No pressure at all. I just feel excited for the opportunity to help as many people as possible. That is so rewarding to me to be able to help people. Jamila, do you feel like as a black woman that people are maybe willing to listen to you or willing to have that conversation with you, whereas maybe if there's a a doctor who's giving them that same advice, who doesn't look like them, doesn't understand where they're coming from, it's a different conversation? Yeah, I I mean, we don't have enough time to get into the history of atrocities that have happened in our community as far as the medical system. So one of the things just being in plant medicine and naturopathic medicine is understanding the conversation and communication and the trust that has to be built with patients. Um, I mean, with cannabis, there are so many socio-political concerns with this plant, you know, and, mm-hmm. and we still have black and brown people who are who are in prisons right now because of this plant. Meanwhile, we have other populations who are, are thriving because of this plant. So the injustice is still present. And so when we're talking about the medicine, it's, it's rooted in history, it's rooted in stigma, it's rooted in fear. You know, the, the conversation about getting pulled over by cops, that's a real thing. Yeah. You know, it's like I can't freely talk to someone about how do you medicate without then going through 
why this is even legal and am I eligible and what happens if I drive down fluorescent you know I mean so it's a it's a loaded kind of way to reach people to medicate and so we are pulling people out of the shadows in some cases to say that it's okay uh, which is also a risk you know we're hoping mm -hmm. that we're being backed by our community and our you know law enforcement when we're saying you know hey get this card follow the legal route so um, it's a constant champion on, on many levels, the medical, the, the political, the legal. Yeah, so you, you find yourself thinking about this. Here's how the, the rules are supposed to work right now. You're right. not 100% certain that they're always going to work the way they're supposed to in every community in Missouri. Look, I'm an optimist, Yeah, but I'm also a St. Louis native. Yeah, you know, So it's unfortunate that I can't say that with confidence. So we try to create the routes. We have a legal place to visit. You know, have the conversations. It's, it's, we do as much as we can to educate. We just need everyone else to hold up their end of the bargain. Do you feel pretty confident at this point, the way things are going, that for your clients, the people that you're introducing this to, you're having that conversation, here's how to get your, your foot in the water, that this is something that this has been a benefit to their life once they take that, that plunge? One thousand percent. I mean, I'm so elated when someone calls me back and say, Adrian, I didn't believe you, but it really does work. Um, you know, and of course, we are all concerned about the lack of diversity um, in this particular space. And I'm hoping that at some point in time, there is a lot more people that look just like me that have their own dispensaries or either, you know, are cultivating or manufacturing. So uh, I don't want to stand in this space by myself. Yeah. You don't want to be there for long either. Like, come, come join me. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, that's actually a great uh, sort of foreshadowing of the next conversation we're going to have here on the show. We're going to talk about what, it, what, what will have to change in Missouri to get more people that look like you into this industry. I think it's a really important conversation. Um, and Adrian Scales-Williams, I want to thank you so much for joining us today and, and wish you the best of success with this. Thank you so much for adding me to your um, schedule. And we are very excited to introduce Luxury Leaf or whatever we can do in the community to help people understand the benefits of cannabis. That's why we're here. And Adrian is the proprietor of Luxury Leaf Dispensary. Again, that's in the Forest Park Southeast neighborhood. And also Jamila Owens-Todd, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And Jamila is a naturopathic doctor. She's also a cannabis consultant and the general manager of Luxury Leaf. Coming up next, we'll discuss how Missouri dropped the ball on giving more black entrepreneurs a shot at medical marijuana licenses. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. Welcome back. Now, just before the break, we talked to Adrian Scales-Williams, who's opened Luxury Leaf in the city's Grove neighborhood. Adrian wasn't just the first black person to open a medical marijuana dispensary in Missouri. She is also one of very, very few black entrepreneurs to get in on the state's medical marijuana boom. The Kansas City Star reports that only three of the state's 192 dispensaries have black owners. That's fewer than 2 percent, and it's below the national average of 5 percent. And it hasn't been for a lack of trying, as Marnay Madison knows all too well. Marnay is the executive director of Exit Now. That's a not-for-profit organization advocating for minorities to get the training and education necessary to enter the cannabis industry. She's also the owner of Fleur Vert Academy, which aims to help inner-city residents get into the cannabis industry. And she joins us today. Marnay, welcome. Hi, how are you all doing? Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for coming. I think this is such an important issue. And I understand you 
you were the president of the Missouri chapter of Minorities for Medical Marijuana. So this was an issue that you really cared about. Yes, this has been my advocation since we legalized cannabis in 2018. I am here standing strong and want to continue to get the message out to our community. But so you personally, you were also hoping to open a dispensary in Missouri. You invested about $80,000 trying to get a license here. What happened? Yes. Um, so unfortunately, like so many people that have the same story as myself, this was not a program created to include people like myself. So with those type of you know requirements and uh, restrictions inside of that application process, we were definitely not um, awarded the license that we deserved. However, we were able able to create better opportunities, learning so much inside of that particular process. Do you know why did the state give you an official reason of why they didn't grant you the license? So this was an application scoring process. Uh, we actually did score above uh, the percentage to be awarded a license. However, with the cap the cap requirements, we weren't able to meet the total number that were awarded. So at that point, it was almost just like a lottery. No. So technically, um, so it was a merit scoring application. So um, we had a specific maximum amount of uh, applications or licenses awarded, excuse me. So each congressional district had a specific amount. So unfortunately, with St. Louis and, you know, Kansas City being one of the largest, you know, um, most minority uh, demographic of cities in the state of Missouri, it was just a really competitive, Mm -hmm. you know, market for people like us to be successful. Okay, so basically, you qualified on the merits, but then they're like, hey, we have too many people doing this in St. Louis, we've got to just, you know, not everybody who qualifies gets a license. Right. But unfortunately, having a $350,000, you know, capital liquid liquidation requirement, you immediately excluded so many people like myself. So it was so many other barriers that, you know, were put in place, but ultimately not having enough, you know, dispensary or cultivation licenses to award was a downfall for most of us. So I understand for you, after this happened in Missouri, you're like, you know what, I'm going to try my luck in Oklahoma. How did that go there? Yes, it was actually awesome. Um, After doing more research about, you know, people in um, the black community, you know, not being awarded licenses, I stumbled across one of the largest um, black ownership in the country, and that happens to be the state of Oklahoma. So my gears got to rolling, and I was like, well, what makes them different from Missouri? Yeah. And it led me down a rabbit hole to basically political legislation. Um, So once I learned about about can, uh, Oklahoma's cannabis legislation. I read, um, you know, page one to the end. Whoa. And <laughs> yes, and I was like, well, I think I'm headed to, you know, Oklahoma. So as I went down to research the market, which uh, market cost analysis is basically what I do for a lot of companies in the cannabis industry. Um, so learning about Oklahoma, I did think that that would be the best fit for not only um, me, for me to be successful, but also to be able to um, create resources and opportunities without having to continually jump across or jump over those big hurdles. So um, Oklahoma is very open and welcoming. Um, This is not a predatorial market. So it was definitely um, very easy for myself. I was able to partner with an Oklahoma resident who also shared the same enthusiasm for the black community in cannabis. Uh, So we partnered up and we created um, what we have now, which is a Herblow Cannabis Company. Um, There there's also um, a third partner, excuse me, which actually the um, founder of Herblo is also another woman from St. Louis. Oh, cool. So very soon you guys will be hearing a lot about our dispensary, our company, and what we have going on in Oklahoma. But so you invested $80,000 trying to make this happen in Missouri. How much would you estimate it cost you to get going in Oklahoma? So as far as the entire process, literally about 40 percent less than uh, what I have spent here um, trying to open up in Missouri. So the cost for the application was twenty five hundred dollars compared to the five to six thousand here in Missouri. Also, there were there weren't any liquid capitalization requirements. So I did not have to call an investor, um, you know, to back me up financially or um, also inside of particular ways of operating things 
that you needed in order to comply. Um, it's it's as easy as going to get a business permit at City Hall, hmm. you know. So they um, just don't have those caps. They're it, basically leaving it open to the market a little bit more. Yes, um, and then that kind of brings in the argument of oversaturation. Um, but we also just saw Oklahoma seize about two thousand licenses because those owners, unfortunately, aren't sustainable business owners. Mm. So that actually creates um, the opportunity for that owner to be able to, you know, obtain a license, but also needs needs to have the business acumen that is required to, you know, op- to stay open and operate. And I believe that in a perfect world, yeah. that's how the cannabis industry should be, right? We should have a business or we should be able to open a business like any other. So you had said part of why you were interested in Oklahoma is it wasn't predatorial. Looking back, do you feel like Missouri's system is predatorial? For sure. When you put in um, verbiage like 30 percent economic distress percentage or 40 percent, right, you specifically, uh, well, excuse me, we specifically put in economic distress zip codes. And unfortunately, um, the black community and inner communities were then predatorily sought out in order to meet those requirements and have advantage over that merit scoring application. So you may see a dispensary in, you know, urban sectors of our cities, and those should be owned by people who can walk out of their house and go open up their business. But unfortunately, their owners are hours away or honestly probably states away because we have a lot of multi-state operators here in Missouri now because of um, how extensive that um, particular requirement was. Yeah, so Missouri designated that there would be certain licenses available in economically distressed zip codes, but people could basically get around that. It didn't have to be long-standing residents of those areas. What did you have to do to, to get one of these economically distressed licenses? Well, you just had to live in a zip code that was listed on that particular um, on that particular application. So this was accumulated by the U.S. Census database, and they basically broke down those zip codes from um, the inner community as as well as the rural community. So Mm -hmm. this was a socioeconomic, you know, particular advantage. Unfortunately, as you just stated earlier, the percentage of minority licenses compared to having an economic advantage, there should have at least been more licenses awarded to those particular underrepresented and disenfranchised communities. People were able to just get in, okay, I'm in the zip code, and like that was good enough. Well, yeah, so we talk about, um, you know, buying a house that yeah. you don't have to live in, yeah. or finding someone at a gas station, or also finding someone who is very credible in cannabis just so happens to meet that zip code and you also don't use them for the application Mm -hmm. there were a lot of black professional people that have they went to cannabis school and universities prior to legalization here in Missouri they were used for their you know professional background and unfortunately don't have jobs with those companies they started with because their overall goal was not to use those individuals once it was time to operate Mm -hmm. So it sounds like, I mean, you're saying the way Oklahoma did this, they weren't saying, hey, we're going to do these kind of set-asides. They also just didn't have people gaming the system the way we saw in Missouri. Missouri kind of tried to have it both ways and ended up with, as you say, this predatorial system where people in your community were being used for these applications versus, in some cases, being able to have the true ownership that you were seeking. Yes, correct. And it was very, you know, saddening. Um, But most importantly, honestly, even seeing, um, you know, um, those of the majority that unfortunately may have been, you know, homeowners or, you know, small business owners in um, their particular communities that spent their last, you know, and unfortunately ended up in the same predicament as us. So I think as a whole, Missouri owes, oh, excuse me, they owe the residents of Missouri um, a way better program. And as we talk about, you know, recreational, um, you know, verbiage and legislation, you know, being rolled out. It is pivotal for us to educate ourselves, read every single page. I know it's extensive. Grab a dictionary. (laughs) You can do it. But we definitely have to understand um, what initiative or what bill specifically, um, you know, works for ourselves, our community and our state. 
We're talking today to Marnay Madison. She's the executive director of Exit Now. That's a nonprofit advocating for people trying to get into the medical marijuana industry. She's also the owner of a dispensary um, in Oklahoma. That's the Fleur Vert Academy. Um, so you're talking about these proposals that would legalize recreational marijuana in Missouri. There's actually three that are being considered at this point. The one that has the big money coming in, and they're working really hard, uh, looks like they're going to be on the ballot. This is Legal Missouri 2022. Are they doing better on these issues of equity than this medical marijuana system that you saw um, operate in a predatory way. Yes. So I I will be honest in saying that I do believe there was effort put into trying to create um, better opportunities. Um, and sometimes, even with that being said, you may not be educated enough on what the community and the people need. So you're only doing the best that you can. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that um, if Legal Missouri actually came into the community, talked to people like myself and luxury leaf owners, uh, you know, and people that have these ancillary cannabis companies, they would have, you know, done better inside of the verbiage of, you know, um, allocating uh, specifically like taxes and, you know, things like that. How, how can you, you know, as an owner, and an operator, you know, give back to the community so that one day we will have those same opportunities. Mm -hmm. So you feel like they're they have a chance to get this right, or so um, I so I am very unbiased. Um, I am um, all about educating mm -hmm. everyone about um, the views from everyone's organization. Um, so do they have a chance? Uh, we're seeing them have a chance, okay. right? But um, unfortunately, I do not think patients understand um, the particulars of ownership. So everyone as a patient and consumer win with every single um, initiative, right, in mm -hmm. each uh, verbiage and bill. However, when we zero in on ownership, who, you know, what that space looks like, that's where we have to educate, you know, ourselves more on. And I do believe people um, stray away from that side because they have already eliminated themselves because of what we are seeing the last few years. Mm -hmm. But if they knew that they had a chance, like Oklahoma, for instance, mm -hmm. they would be very more involved, you know, with what they can do to change and be impactful. Mm -hmm. um, so when we talk about um, you know, initiatives like Fair Access Missouri. You know, I, this is another one trying to make the ballot. They're they're a little bit further behind, I think it's fair to say, but they're working yes. on it. Yes, they are working on it, and I'm actually um, hoping to you know speak with um, someone inside of their um, petition or their organization very soon because I do believe that there needs to be you know more light inside of what Fair Access Missouri is offering to the community. Um, as far as Legal Missouri. When we talk about what has already happened in the community and them wanting to basically um, grandfather themselves in and then open up a lottery process for everyone else, you still, once again, do not do the communities that were wrong a, a service because having a lottery or pool of people is automatically saying, well, we don't know who's going to get this. Mm -hmm. And we should be able to say specifically the black community, the Hispanic community, the Asianic community has, you know, sent in this many applications and we are going to award them first round pick because society has showed us and history has showed us that they have been some of the most disenfranchised. So in Fair Access Missouri, the funds that are allocated towards groups and organizations like Exit Now and other, you know, organizations that are doing an impact to the community, they are receiving revenue and funds to even create business grants for black, you know, and Hispanic um, companies that are wanting to get into the industry. And inside of Legal Missouri, I just don't see them doing enough to actually get us in. Hmm. We should mention there's also a third possibility of how this could go, and that is that the legislature is looking at a proposal that would give them more control um, versus putting it in the hands of the voters the way these other two would. In just our final minute here, how do you feel about what the state lawmakers are up to? Yes, um, I think they're doing a great job trying to combat um, with Legal Missouri as we're seeing Fair Access Missouri is just going to need a little more help. Um, I am grateful enough to have verbiage inside of all of these particular um, legislations. Um, well, 
proposals. And I am hoping that, you know, even with us having that um, particular leverage, that we have at least some win inside of, you know, every single one. Um, with the House bill, I am just afraid of things that they can amend once it's voted in. So it's the last minute addition. Yes. Yeah. But other than that, I appreciate all of our political officials that are in the Capitol fighting for us in cannabis legislation. We appreciate everything that you all are doing and the community. Um, I would just state that educate ourselves, read, 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 and definitely uh, continue to be in the community and shed in light on inclusion and education in the community. Well, Marnay Madison, thank you so much for joining us today. Yes, thank you for having me. And Marnay is the executive director of Exit Now, as well as the owner of Fleurvert Academy. Today's episode was produced by Emily Woodbury with audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at ChooseWood.com.